Hi everyone, I hope you've had a good week of home learning and that you're looking forward to safely enjoying the bank holiday weekend with your families. I'm doing this video because this Friday we celebrate a very significant event in British history, well in fact in world history. It's the 75th anniversary of VE Day and hopefully by the end of the video you'll have a better understanding of what that means. We're going to look at four key questions to help us unpick this. We're going to think about what is VE Day, when did it happen, how do people celebrate and why is it significant? So let's get started. What is VE Day? Well, it stands for Victory in Europe Day, which marked the end of the fighting that had been going on across Europe throughout the Second World War. Although it's important for us to remember that the war as a whole continued until August because there was still fighting going on over in the Pacific. It was on the 7th of May 1945, after six years of hostility, so aggression and violence between countries, suffering and a great deal of resilience and courage across the continent that our Prime Minister Winston Churchill announced that Germany had finally surrendered. Now a public holiday was announced for the 8th of May to allow all people the opportunity to celebrate. Um, although it's important for us to remember that not all people would have felt the same level of joy because for some there would have been um, a lot of apprehension about what would happen next and there'd also be a level of sadness thinking about those people that weren't able to be there that have sadly lost their lives in the war. Now I've got a bit of a challenge question particularly if you're in year five or six to think about. Was everyone in Europe glad that the war was over? You might want to pause the video and make some bullet points um, to show me your opinion or draw some pictures or you might want to go away and do a little bit more research into the war um, to be able to form a proper argument, a paragraph maybe for and against, thinking about um, reasons why people were happy that the war was over on both sides, so both here in Britain with our allies, as well as people in Germany also being glad that the war was over even though they'd lost, um, and then challenge yourself to try and come up with maybe a couple of points about who might have not been so happy that the war was over. So anyone that was doing really well during the war um, and maybe any companies that were really benefiting from the production of certain equipment that was needed for the war. Now in order for us to understand the importance of an event like VE Day in history I think it's really valuable for us to look at where it fits into what we call the big picture of history and where it how it relates to the topics that we've learned about in school. So the first topic that you learn about is the Stone Age and I can't fit all of the Stone Age onto this timeline, it would be extremely long um, because the Stone Age first um, arrived in Britain in 900,000 BCE, okay, so around that time. I wonder how many lots of this timeline I would need to draw to get back to that point. If any of you are really good at maths, maybe you could work it out. At that point, um, the early Stone Age we call the Paleolithic period, we were hunter-gatherers, so we were travelling around looking for food every single day. The next period is the Mes Mesolithic period, the Middle Stone Age, that still doesn't fit onto my timeline because it began 8000 BCE and that's when we beca um, began to move around less, set up camps and get a bit more smart about how we're finding food. The first time that does fit onto my timeline is the Neolithic period, and that is the late Stone Age, when we started to develop farming. So we didn't have to move around anymore, we could just live off the crops and the animals that we were keeping. This is followed by the Bronze Age, which is very similar to the Neolithic period, only we've started to be able to work with types of metal like tin, gold, copper and bronze so we could get more effective in our methods of farming and life began to get easier. And then that's followed by the Iron Age, where people learn to make stronger tools and better weapons. And that, along with a growing population, meant that there was more fighting over land. And we had the development of these hill forts, which meant that people could live in a more protected environment. And that, from the Stone Age up to that point is what we call prehistory. That's all the time before written evidence of what happened in the past. And while that was happening, you see similar developments and civilizations start to appear all over the world. Um, one example I'm going to show you is what we look at in year three, ancient Egypt. So you can see there 
to over in Africa, in Egypt, at the same time, from the Neolithic period through to the Iron Age, we had um, a similar development of a civilization building up over time their way of living. Now, the Iron Age is brought to an end with the expansion of the Roman Empire. This wasn't a sudden change that happened. It happened over a number of years. In 55 BCE, we have um, Julius Caesar who invades but fails to claim Britain as part of the Roman Empire. It then takes about 90 years of planning um, and a couple of failed attempts before we get Emperor Claudius who orders an invasion in 43 CE, so common era, uh, under the command of Aulus Plautius, or have you say his name, that was an army that came over and did manage to conquer Britain. So then we get Roman Britain. Now, at the end of that time, the um, soldiers start to go back to Rome to protect Rome itself, and that leaves Britain poorly defended. And two groups of people spot an opportunity in Britain. The first is the Anglo-Saxons who come over around 450 CE. They start setting up homes over here and start taking land. Now at the same time, um, we have the Vikings. Their first raid that's recorded is in uh, 789 CE. So they've come over first to try and get money and wealth. And then they see um, the good farmland that we have here in Britain and they decide that they want to start taking parts of the land and living here as well. So we kind of have two groups uh, that battle back and forth to try and keep land. Both of those groups of people are brought to an end. Their, their time here in Britain is brought to an end with the arrival of William the Conqueror. Okay, so he comes from Normandy and comes and takes Britain as his own and becomes the first, the first king that we say is king of all of Britain. Um, and normally in primary schools, we stop looking at history there. So I would suggest perhaps though, that you go away and you have a look at the horrible history song, the monarch song. Um, it will then teach you all of the kings and queens of, the kings and queens of Britain that come after that point. Um, and it will get stuck in your head. You will learn them off by heart. So after that, there are lots of, um, lots of different periods. The periods tend to get shorter and shorter over time. So more changes start to happen in a shorter period. We have things like the Middle Ages, um, Tudors, uh, lots of times of change and industrial revolution and the Victorians. And throughout that time, there's the development of huge technologies, um, better trade routes, better transport, but along with that development comes mounting tensions between these countries that have built up over time. And that means that in 1914, we have the outbreak of World War I. And that lasts until 1918. Now, I want you to have a little think about this question. How did the Germans feel after World War I? The Germans lost the First World War. So there's already that kind of sense of disappointment. Then they have six months of negotiating a settlement to try and make the countries happy and keep that peace. So in 1919, we have Germany finally signing a treaty, an agreement called the Treaty of Versailles. And that forced Germany to pay a huge amount of money to the countries that it had damaged throughout the war. So we have life that's already quite tough in Germany because of the loss of the war, the loss of lives. Then we have these um, huge payments that they have to make to other countries. And then we have something called the Great Depression. And it, it kind of is sparked by something called the Wall Street crash that you might have heard of that happened in America in 1929. But that had a huge ripple effect to lots and lots of other countries. Um, and that is where people that had invested, so put lots of money to buy part of a business um, lost that money because that part of the business became kind of worthless. It's very complicated to explain, so I won't go into it, but it basically meant that people couldn't trade as much and people became poorer. Now, all of that's happened 
Germany is in a very sorry state. And you can kind of start to see why the type of extreme views that start to be um, developed can seem quite appealing to some people. Doesn't excuse any of it, but they start to be able to believe that if they blame people, um, that they can kind of find a solution to this. So what happens is you get an extreme of um, a rise of extreme views across parts of Europe, specifically in Germany and also in Russia, which both led to the discrimination and mistreatment of groups of people in these countries and beyond. So Germany starts mistreating certain groups of people. It also starts to break parts of the treaty that they'd signed after the First World War in order to gain back land. And Britain and France don't really do anything for a while. In fact, a lot of countries try and sign agreements while things aren't going so well in their countries with the economy and money. They try and just keep Germany happy so they don't have to go to another war. But then in 1939, Germany breaks these new agreements and the UK and France decide that they will go to war to protect Poland, who they've agreed to protect if Germany invades, which they do. So then we have these six long years of fighting back and forth and more countries get involved. We have Russia um, on our side, the USA on our side, and then on the other side, we have Germany who gets joined at one point by Italy and then by Japan. So lots of countries then get back involved with World War II. And you can imagine the, the devastating effect that that has on all of those countries. So finally, we hear in 1945, Churchill announcing that on VE Day, Germany had surrendered. Japan hadn't, but Germany had. And that was that that was very significant um, for lots of reasons that we'll look at in a moment. So Churchill said the German war is therefore at an end. We may allow ourselves a brief moment of rejoicing. Today is victory in Europe Day. And the people celebrated. So people across the country came together. They decorated the streets with banners, bunting and flags. In fact, I believe that they could go out and purchase red, white and blue bunting without using their rationing coupons. So without having to spend those coupons that were given to them, um, which was like their daily allowance of things that they could buy in the shops. They joined parades, they had street parties where they um, put tables out into the street, bought all their rationing, bought all their food out, people baked things. Um, that they shared together, they sang and danced, watched fireworks and lit bonfires. So, and if you watch that video, I'll send the link out with this one, you can hear a little bit of Churchill's speech and see some of the celebrations happening. I wonder if you've ever experienced a party or celebration like this. Some of you might remember, um, I remember when we had the last royal wedding, that that was quite a spectacular event to see um, see people celebrating in London but you might have had a party yourself that was quite big where people got together and you have that sense of community I guess now we have the clap for carers at the moment which isn't really um isn't really a party but it, it does still celebrate people and you get that sense of community if you're all going out together to clap so maybe you can kind of think about that on a much bigger scale where everyone's out on the street celebrating Here's a little task if you want to have a go at doing it. You, what I like to do is look at a source and unpick it thinking about three things. What we can see, what we think and what we wonder. Now you might want to create yourself a little table on a bit of paper or you might just want to make some notes or draw some pictures of what you see and then write some stuff around it. So for example, I would start by thinking about just what I can actually see in the picture, not jumping to any conclusions. So things like, I can see children sat at a table. I can see food on the table. I can see people smiling. I can see a woman carrying um, bottles or drinks or glasses. And you pick apart all those things that you can see and make a list of them. Then you can start to be a bit of a historian and think about what that might tell us. What do you believe is happening in the picture? So. I believe the children are celebrating VE Day. 
I think people are happy because they've just listened to Churchill's speech. Um, I think that the food on the table has been made by all of the people that have stood around. Things like that. See if there's anything else that you can think of, anything that you think is going on, the stories that you can make up um, for these people based on what is in the picture. What are reasonable conclusions to come to based on what's in the picture? And then the final thing, though, is for you to think about any questions that you'd want to ask to help you really understand what the picture shows. There are still lots of things that we don't know. I don't know exactly when this was taken. I want to know um, where this was taken. I want to know who the people are, etc. So you can make a list of questions. You might want to pause the video and do that now, or you could come back and have a go at that later. People particularly celebrated in the capital. So in London, crowds gathered, particularly in Trafalgar Square and all the way along to Buckingham Palace. They were eager to see the Prime Minister along with the King, King George, and his wife and the two princesses, um, one of which is now our current Queen. And they all gathered and really enjoyed listening and just listening to his speech firstly which they would have heard over the radio and then getting to go and see him just catch a glimpse of him amongst the crowds of him waving at everyone and it is also said that those two princesses Elizabeth and, and Margaret supposedly snuck out later to join in the celebration and dancing with everyone else I don't think that the royal family could get away with doing that today without being recognized so that's kind of an overview of how people celebrated and why is all of this significant then? Why should we remember it? Well, the Second World War itself was a significant event. It impacted the lives of people in Britain and across Europe, across the world. So because this was a key moment in the war, that itself makes it quite a significant thing. Then we have the fact that although Japan hadn't surrendered and the war as a whole wasn't at an end, because Germany had, that meant that all that attention that we'd been giving to fighting the war in Europe could be put over to fighting the war in the Pacific and ultimately ending the war quicker. Um, and if it hadn't have ended when it, when it did, then many more lives would have probably been lost. It's important for us to remember um, the events that happened so that we can make sure that that we try and avoid those same mistakes that were made that caused the war and that we remember those people and animals that fought so hard, made so many sacrifices and those that ultimately died to protect our view of, to protect our culture and our society and how we believe um, that people should be treated. I wonder if you can think of any other reasons why it is a significant event and make a list of those. What can you do? What can you do to join in and remember? Well, we probably would have had some street parties going on if it wasn't for the current situation, but there are still things that you can do to join in. There's a two minute silence in the morning on Friday um, that you could do in your house or on your doorstep to remember those people. There's also going to be a nation's toast. So you might want to join in and raise a glass of whatever you like to drink, um, not alcoholic children. To those who gave so much, we thank you. And then time with your family. Time with your family to think together about what's happened and maybe to do a little bit of learning. And then finally, if you're still awake at nine o'clock, which I hope that some of you um, lower down in the school won't be, um, you could sing together, we'll meet again. Now, if you're not still awake, you might want to do that earlier in the day. It'd be nice to maybe see some clips of some children singing. There are I'll also maybe send out these links down here, which give you some more details of how you can celebrate. And then there's some activities that I think would be nice if you wanted something to do. So we have a picture done by Lowry, who we've studied in year three. And I want you to maybe look at it and think about, does Lowry's painting represent VE Day? So what evidence is there when you look at it that this picture does show VE Day, what fits in with what you've seen. Maybe you could even draw your own version of VE Day.
using some of the techniques that Lowry has used. And then consider if all people would have had experienced had experiences like this on that day. Maybe there's some things that you think are missing from the picture or some things that you think not everyone would have seen. So have a think about that. Activity number two, you could write a postcard. You could write to a family member or friend who wasn't with you on VE Day to tell them about your celebrations. And you could draw a picture on the other side of that bit of paper as well to show your celebrations, what you specifically did. And finally, you can design your own bunting. You might have already seen around that some people have made bunting and hung it up in their windows. Um, this picture here is from Bletchley Park, which show you how to make bunting using material. But you could also just use a bit of paper, find the middle and then just draw a line up to each corner and just draw on it, decorate it that way and colour it in. And there's also, um, if you go on the BBC, which this is a link to, there's a step-by-step -step guide also on creating bunting. So that might be something really nice that you might want to put up to decorate the front of your house or just decorate inside your house in your bedroom, maybe. Now, I hope that that has helped you understand a bit more about, about what VE Day is and some of the things that led up to it that might have caused it and, and those events that meant that it was so significant to lots of people at the time and even now. I hope that you have a lovely bank holiday weekend and that you enjoy learning a bit more about VE Day and maybe watching the Queen's speech to see what she says about it. Have a great weekend.